the mic. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to call to order the Board of Directors Wednesday, May 15th board meeting. Will everyone join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Connie, can I have a roll call, please? Eva Henry? Here. Jeff Baker? Here. 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 Priority. Here. Counties first. Here. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. I'd like to welcome new members Rebecca White from the Colorado, Colorado Department of Transportation. She's been here for a few months, but now she's official and she's graduated to the big kids table. table. <laughs> uh, moving right along, move to approve the agenda. Need a motion? So moved. A second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Asked, let the record reflect we're one minute ahead of time for Mr. Roth. <laughs> we're moving into the community spotlight. City of Aurora. This for you. That doesn't mean you have an extra minute, though. So I'm supposed to have peace. Are you holding the suspense? No. I never hold you up, Bob. So for those who may not know, I'm Bob Routh. I'm the mayor pro tem for the city of Aurora, and we were selected to be one of the spotlight cities this, this week, so, or this month. So I have a, a brief video and then some slides to go through talking about the city of Aurora.
just in that video, there's probably things about Aurora already that you didn't know. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our planning for the future of the city. Uh, the city is only about 50% built out. We're uh, pretty unique in a couple of aspects that we have plenty of land and we have lots of water resources. 96% um, of our water comes from mountain sources from three different basins. So when there's a drought in one part of the state, we're usually pretty well covered with the other two basins. Um, quality city services, we are a full, city, full service city. This is, talks about the uh, economic activity, uh, 144,000 inspections last year, 60,000 just at Gaylord. I don't know if you've heard about Gaylord, it's this little 2.2 <laughs> million square foot, 1500 room hotel and convention center. Uh, 88,000 calls to the permit center, 98% satisfaction rate, rating, a minute and a half, minute and 42 wait time on average, no paper plans, everything's electronic, and 5,500 contract license issued, 40,000 housing units have been approved. Gaylord Rockies, 2.2 million actually, 1,501. I've asked what that one room was. Evidently, just the way the architecture worked out, there was an extra room. I, I don't know if it's the penthouse suite or what it is, but uh, for those of you who haven't been there, eight food and beverage op options, huge aquatic center, um, and there are room nights booked out to almost 2030. It's, up, it's actually up to about 1.3 million room nights booked so far. Stanley Marketplace. Stanley Marketplace is a very unique venue. It was an old aviation manufacturing facility where they actually in the 40s and 50s and 60s built ejection chairs, pilot ejection chairs. Um, there was a vision by some of the business people to make it into a shopping area. A lot of unique things about it. The co-working space is one, but one of the other things is that there, it's a real collaborative. There are no chains in it. It's all first to the market restaurants and boutique stores, and they do a lot of collaboration between the businesses. And the one example I would give is that there's a fitness center and there's also a yoga place, and the fitness center has agreed not to offer yoga, and they've even cooperated to the point where you can buy a pass that works at both places. Healthcare in Aurora, uh, a lot of people don't know, yes, Anschutz Campus is in Aurora, it's not in the city and county of Denver. Um, it is about 24,000 people currently work on campus, and uh, it says 40,000. I've heard actually f closer to 50,000 on full build-out will be working on that campus. $5.6 billion economic impact to the region. To give you a perspective, that is more economic impact than the entire ski industry in all of Colorado. Fitzsimmons Innovation Campus, this is where the, the actually, th this is one of the only campuses in the, in the nation where there's a working hospital, a teaching hospital, and R&D taking place on the same campus. So a, a professor can, can be a, a working doctor, teach, uh, teach students, and also take their idea and spawn new innovation at the research facility. Some of the accolades that, that we've had given to us over the years, I'm not going to read them. You can see number one fittest city in the nation. I wanted to point that out because, you know. <laughs> so we like to say great things, are, great things are happening in Aurora, and I'd be happy to take any comments or questions. Great job, Mr. Roth. Is there any questions for Aurora? Okay, next up, Town of Bennett. Larry's just sitting there, encouraging <laughs> staff. Yep. <laughs> Being the professional. I should pretend like I lost my voice and, and be like, Larry, Larry, you have to do it. this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you've got to like her. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I am Trish Stiles. I am the town excuse me, town administrator for the town of Bennett. Um, Trustee Vidim asked me to come this evening and present to you, so I'm just going to give you a little bit about what's happening in Bennett. 
Um, I hope I don't have to um, have too many in the room that don't know where Bennett is, but Bennett is east on I-70, uh, just about 10 miles past the uh, toll road there. So let me give you a little bit about what's going on in our small but busy and bustling town. Uh, we're in exciting time of growth within the town of Bennett. Um, it's um, it's it's busting at the seams, I guess you would say. Uh, we've had a lot of focus on our infrastructure investment, um, ranging from our brand new town hall, which we dearly love, to uh, we did uh, roads improvements, we've done a brand new water tower, a brand new wastewater treatment facility, and still more to come. And then I thought I'd share a little bit about um, how we're able to do a lot of this is through our grant funding and other sources that we um, managed to find and come by. Uh, so recently, Bennett has approved so far 475 residential homes uh, in the last two years. We do have application for several more. I know that's some consternation with Trustee Vidim, uh, but we are anticipating additional growth. Um, we currently have 1,700 acres of entitled land, so we have a lot of room to grow. Um, we're trying to focus on houses that will be attainable um, for Bennett and the surrounding community. Our price points are starting at a, at a not what I would call affordable, but definitely less expensive. Um, so we think that that will be of interest to those that are moving um, into Colorado or from other areas um, in the metro region. Uh, we've identified several economic development priorities. Uh, those include the hospitality industry, um, health, and then as well as looking for industrial and primary employers. So we've got great spaces for those. Uh, we estimate that um, we will have uh, 4,500 units available uh, for a full um, build out in those entitled areas over the next 15 to 20 years. So a lot of different things happening um, and lots of room to grow. Uh, there's a picture of our new wastewater treatment facility. Uh, we were uh, also awarded recently a uh, project from DOLA. We're doing a pilot project where we're doing something that's called CAMP, uh, which is our capital asset inventory master plan and putting that master plan document actually into GIS. So there will be no document that actually comes out of this. Um, everything will be uh, based in that GIS system. Uh, this will now lead us towards our additional um, needs for growth, our additional needs for asset management, um, improvements on infrastructure, so it'll be a great tool to have um, and all at our fingertips as well as uh, will be based upon our website so that you can kind of find out more information and have a lot of good tools available to almost everyone. Um, this is our, like I said, our new wastewater treatment facility. We're actually calling it a water recovery facility. The idea being that while it's wastewater treatment today, the idea is that we will produce reuse uh, out of that facility in order to stretch our water um, within the area. We're currently only on a groundwater resource. Um, we're trying to work on that as well. Uh, but that's that would be a huge improvement for the I-70 corridor to have some other water resources brought to us. So we're actively working on that. Um, in the past couple of years, like I said, we've had an investment of $22 million in infrastructure. Um, and just to give you a kind of overall snapshot, our general fund is only $3.5 million. Um, again, we work really hard um, tonight. I'm very excited. Uh, we'll be working on this uh, eastbound off-ramp. Uh, the picture I have here today is not too bad. Um, I can produce some others, but you can definitely see we get a backup there, so we're really excited that uh, we were awarded both Adams and Arapahoe County Sub-Regional Forum dollars, so we're looking forward to getting some improvements there, um, but I thought I'd share with you what our project looks like, and we're very excited. Um, and again, it was a layer cake and a partnership amongst uh, the town and the counties and CDOT, so we're very proud of um, being able to pro about provide some upgrades to our residents. Um, I thought I'd share with you uh, to date, as of yesterday, um, we have received um, 
quite a few grants. Currently, we have budgeted $3.7 million in new projects. We've received $2.63 million in grant and other funding, uh, and we're able to match that with just $1.1 million, $1 million uh, in town funds. So we take our dollars and stretch them as far as possible. Uh, we'll also be doing new parks and new trails, um, as well as a new public works facility will be coming online. And I just have to say, I think I work with one of the most amazing teams uh, out there. This is a picture of all of our town staff, and we truly are like family. This is one of the joys of being in a smaller community that uh, you get the opportunity to really get to know your neighbors, you get to know the people you work with, and I'm proud to be their leader. Exciting stuff in the town of Bennett. Good job. Any questions for? All of those over there. Well, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> I don't see any questions, so we'll go ahead and move on. Thank you very much. That was great. Report of the chair. I was not able to attend the RTC, so I'll look to the co-chair uh, for a report. Thank you, chair. Um, we did a uh, pretty good job, I think. Very little. Uh, we, we addressed um, tonight's action items, uh, 10, 13, 15, 16, and 17. Uh, we had unanimous agreement on all of them to push them forward. Um, and again, very little, if, if no discussion on each of the items. So everybody was very happy with, with staff's presentation and uh, voted to push forward. Thank you for taking care of that, Mr. Dyack. Next up, uh, Performance and Engagement Committee uh, Director Stolzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We met this evening for performance and engagement, and we talked about two main topics. One is the collaboration assessment that you will all be getting on June 7th. It's an important feedback tool so that we can understand how we're all working together and we can see if there are areas where we need to improve or which area we need the most improvement and if there are things that need to be addressed. So if you look in your email box on June 7th, go ahead and take that assessment early. That would help everybody out. And if you don't, we'll help remind you to take the collaboration <laughs> assessment. The, the next thing, um, if everybody could get out their phone and put on their calendars that on August 23rd and 24th, we're all going to be together in Keystone. And we have some really great things planned for the annual retreat. So we talked about some of the topics for the retreat, what things need to be different from last year. But I don't see your phones, but you, you're all supposed to take out your phones <laughs> and, and, and program August 23rd and 24th, because we're all going to be in Keystone. All right. That's all we talked about. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Stolzman. Next up, fin uh, Finance and Budget Committee, Director Flynn. Where I looked past you for a minute there. Thank you. Uh, we met today and we acted on three items. Uh, we um, authorized the Executive Director to uh, execute a contract with RTD for reimbursement for the Guaranteed Ride Home Program as part of the RTD EcoPass Program. And we also authorized uh, the executive director to accept additional state funds for the uh, from the Colorado Department of Human Services and, and allocate up to 17.2 million in pass-through funds uh, to AAA service contractors. These are this is a reallocation of uh, end of the year funds that we need to uh, get out to our providers and for them to utilize by June 30th, which is the end of the state fiscal year. And uh, we were told at the meeting uh, that generally we, we've been able to. Uh, spend all of the reallocated funds, even though we have the short time frame, because our providers do have the capacity to get the service out. Uh, rarely have we had to uh, turn any funds back, which is a good thing for our seniors. And we also finally uh, authorized the executive director to amend a contract with Urban Sim to uh, move uh, part of moving our uh, socioeconomic economic modeling and forecasting to uh, the cloud and. Uh, I'm not of the generation that even understands the cloud anymore, but that's where we're moving it. And we, we authorize that, uh, even though I don't understand it. <laughs> There's this cloud. This is director. You know the cloud. I don't know yeah. the cloud. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, we're going to skip over the next one real quick as Connie's uh, chiseling away at the wood right now. She'll be right back. <laughs> so we're almost so announcement of the public hearing. So 
The Denver Regional Council of Governments, Dr. Cog, has scheduled a public hearing for July 17th at 6.30 p.m. in this room to receive comments on the draft 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program, known as the TIP, and Associated Air Quality Conformity Determinations. Further information about the public hearing will be available on Dr. Cog's website, including the draft documents and how to provide comment no later than June 17th. There's, there's that one. And next up, we'll go ahead to the report of the executive director, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 2019 award celebration. As you entered the room this evening, you notice we sh were sharing some images from that event. Um, I know many of you were there, and thank you very much. We had over about 400 in attendance, um, which was actually down from our original date, and it was a Friday and all, but we were happy with the results. And I just, before I go any further, I just want to give a shout out to staff again, like I did at the event. It's, it's a ridiculous amount of work. It's even more ridiculous when you got to do it twice. So uh, I really do appreciate all the work that uh, our communications and marketing staff have done, as well as others, of course, within, uh, on the Dr. Cox staff. Um, so uh, Senator Bennett was actually at the meeting. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah. So, um, what? Senator Bennett was, was also in attendance, and he was there. Uh, his wife, Susan Daggett, received a uh, Distinguished Service Award, so that was kind of cool because he had just announced a day before, two days before, so he was a busy man, so it was nice to see him. Um, and, of course, it was always great to celebrate all the wonderful projects and people that make this region go the way it goes. And, and uh, so we're always so proud of, um, of uh, you know, the, the opportunity to, to recognize all those folks. Um, of course, the highlight of the night was the John B. Christensen Award, which is our, which are our, our biggest award, um, and uh, you know it's always kept a secret before before the the name is announced. And uh, Centennial, former Centennial Mayor Kathy Noon received that award for pr primarily because of her work that she did in her community with regards to, quite frankly, actually incorporating the city and all kinds of stuff like that. So, and her work that she's done on the Dr. Cog board and uh, through our aging, aging advisory committee and all that kind of good stuff. So we were so happy to be able to recognize Kathy. And she actually sent me a note earlier today um, that, I, that I, 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 uh, I told her that I would read to you all today. She says, Dr. Cog board, I want to thank you for the amazing honor in receiving the John, John B. Christensen Award. It was certainly a huge surprise and very humbling. After 12 plus years on the aging, aging committee on advisory committee on aging and five years on the Dr. Cog board while mayor, I certainly feel part of the Dr. Cog family. The mission of the organization, the commitment to its members, um, uh, establishment of the mission and collaboration necessary to accomplish the mission makes Dr. Cog unique in government. It's been a wonderful experience, and I look forward to many more years of participation. Warm regards, Kathy Noon. So that was awfully sweet of her to do that. Um, and I will say, I, I also, oh, another one are in the room. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Mayor, Mayor Ron Murkowski and uh, Mayor Stephanie Pico. Um, Quite frankly, they just straight up lied to Kathy about in, in order to get. I mean, there's, there, there's no other way of putting it. I mean, they, they straight up lied in order to get her to that event, um, and it was it was actually Mayor Rakowski's uh, suggestion that um, uh, to basically tell Kathy that he was getting the the John B. Christensen Award, and 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 he wouldn't. It was not acceptable if she wasn't in the room. Um, so that was kind of cool. Yeah. So that was nice of Ron to do. So it, it, was, it was a great event. Uh, collaboration assessment, don't have to handle that. Director Stolzman did that. Board work, shop, don't need to handle that either. You did great, Ashley. Uh, bike to work day, at your tables, um, there's a little bike to work day flyer. Bike to work day this year is June uh, 26th. It's a Wednesday. Uh, registration is now open, and we're hoping this year to get about 37,000 riders, which is up a little bit for us. We're, of course, very proud of the fact that it's the second largest of its kind in the, in the country. Um, so please help us make that a success. If you would, just reach out to your staffs and share the information. So we also have available on the table uh, against the back wall, against the side wall here to the left, uh, opportunities for you guys to sign up for, uh, for T-shirts. 
So please do that. It's free of charge to you guys. So please, uh, please do that. We have some pretty cool designs this year. I really like them. Or hats. There's hats there too if you're so inclined. Last month I mentioned a uh, funding opportunity through CDPAG, um, which we're doing in partnership with them. Really, we're just assisting in, in getting the word out. Um, and it's a real opportunity for local governments to identify and implement community scale projects that promote healthy, active, and well-connected communities through short-term, low-cost improvements. And uh, the, the awards have actually been, uh, been, been given out, and there are four within our region received those. Uh, Lakewood received an award for connecting, and in, uh, when I say award, I mean it's, it's a cash award. Um, uh, connecting and encouraging active people in places along Lakewood's annual Bike to Work Day routes and 40 West Art Line. Edgewater received some monies for uh, 25th Avenue pop-up traffic calming. Castle Rock also received some monies for downtown Castle Rock bike racks. And uh, Aurora received some funding for uh, a wayfinding pilot that they're doing. So congratulations to you all. Two, two additional items uh, for you this evening. Um, Mayor, speaking of Mayor Ron Murkowski, he was recognized by the Colorado House of Representatives on April 24th. They, it was a proclamation, proclamation designating April 24th as Ron Rakowski Day, uh, and it was read from the House floor expressing uh, the uh, legislators, legislature's sincere commendation for his many years of public service. So that was a pretty cool event. Uh, I know, I know uh, Director Lance was at that, that event, and it, it was all pretty cool. There's a couple quotes from an article that I pulled uh, from The Villager that I just wanted to read to you. I thought were kind of cool. So um, Representative Terry Carver from the Springs area, uh, when she took the podium, she said, she, when she took the podium, she said, when I was a JAG, when I was in the JAG, Colonel Rakowski was, the, was a renowned lawyer, leader, mentor, and one of the true icons and shining stars in the Air Force Jags. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, Susan Beckman described Rakowski as the kind of public servant in local government that, who gets things done. And uh, last but not least, Ron, Ron Bockefeld, who was a Dr. Cog chair at one time, took the podium and described Rakowski's unique skills in crafting legal motions during his service at the Denver Regional Council of Governments. The way I heard that described was, when he needed a motion, he looked at Ron, and Ron gave it. But uh, regardless, it was, <laughs> they got through it. So that, that was a pretty cool, and I'm, I'm real happy for Ron. And please, if you would, Director, if you would bring that back to him, that we're, off, we're I'm sure I speak for the full board, that we're real proud of him. Um, last but not least, I, I want to just m take this opportunity just to mention uh, a, a campaign which is ongoing right now. Our very own director, Bob Roth, is, is a finalist in the Leukemia, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's 2019 Man of the Year. Chuck, would you put, I got a, I got a, a web page there, it's, it's a Chrome page, could you just pop that up? Um, as you probably know, this is, this is LLS's, this is their largest annual fundraiser, and uh, the, the deadline for, for donations is Saturday, May 18th. So if you're interested in donating, um, please use the link that, that's provided at the top of the page. And if you can't read that, please come see me after the meeting or Flo Ritano's. This is actually Flo's page. Her, her, um, her and myself and Flo are on uh, Bob's team with regards to this. Um, of course, you know, blood cancers. This touched me personally. My father passed away in, 20, in 2007 related to a blood cancer, and so it's a great opportunity to provide to a very worthy cause and, quite frankly, a cool gentleman. So anything we can do to help Mr. Roth, I, I'm all in. So if you wouldn't mind considering um, a donation that would be fabulous. Bob, did you have anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to add a couple things. So this is a, it's a very unique fundraising opportunity. It's called a uh, fundraising competition. And every year they try to get 10 men and 10 women. Uh, this year it happens there's nine men and I believe six women. So there will be a man of the year and a woman of the year. And of course it's based on total fundraising. But it's a competition because none of us, I know how much I've raised, but I don't know how much any of the other men have raised so far. And there's, there's several ways that, that you raise money. I sold corporate tables, individual donations through my link or my team members' links, um, and then auction items. Um, so there's a number of different opportunities. And then at, at the gala, which is this Saturday, uh, there's actually a paddle raise as well. 
so people can donate that night as well. So it's it's a big build up that evening with introducing all the candidates and uh, their teams and 750 people will be in attendance. And uh, at the end of the evening, they announce the winners of man and woman of the year. And I almost made a mistake and told you how much I've raised, but I'm not supposed to do that. But it is, uh, I, I set a goal for myself. Uh, I've done extremely well. I'm very proud of the team and what they've done. I will tell you, I'm still 30,000 shy of my original goal, which was pretty aspirational, I'd, I'll admit. But um, if you're, you know, we all have big networks that we through the things that we do. If you um, are interested in donating, please do. If you're interested in just sharing it with your network, that would be wonderful as well. And I thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I'm done with my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, public comments. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Seeing none. All right, so now we'll go back. The wood has been whittled <laughs> and shaved and carved. So we'll get Director Teal up here from Castle Rock for his five year anniversary. Wow, yeah, that's a good beetle kill one. Well done, Douglas. Okay. Next up, uh, we do have a correction on the minutes. We need to add Joe Wilson from Commerce City as attending the meeting. So I'm looking for a motion to approve the amended or the corrected minutes for March 20th, 2019. Uh, Okay, Jones it, and then Flynn. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Abstentions, that's passed. Moving right on to the action items, number 10. Uh, discussion of the resolution amending the 2018-2021 Transportation Improvement Program Attachment B, Mr. Cottrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening. Uh, before you um, this evening, we have six amendments for your consideration. Uh, the first being the Region 1 Faster Transit Pool. This amendment would add $8.5 million in faster funds along with three pool projects. Um, for additional information, uh, these amendments are part of a recent CDOT transit call for projects that was conducted. Um, additional projects can be found within the administrative, administrative modifications which are in the back of your agenda. The second amendment for your consideration is the Region 4 2013 flood related pool projects. Um, this is where $20 million is being requested to, in federal emergency funds to be added um, in fiscal year 19 for the State Highway 7 flood repairs. The third amendment is the Region 4 non-regionally significant RPP pool. And this amendment would add $5.6 million for one new pool project, plus additional funds for one existing pool project. So the remaining three amendments uh, are necessary to move funding um, into the I-25 capacity improvements project or the I-25 gap project uh, to help cover the transition between uh, construction project phases two and three. Uh, the first amendment in that package would be for the region one surface treatment pool. This would move out and transfer $2.8 million in surface treatment funds to the GAP project. Um, the second change would be for the Region 1 faster pool. Um, very similarly, this would transfer out $2.2 million um, to the I-25 GAP project. In addition, this would also add one new pool project using the available funds that are contained within the project. Uh, and finally, our changes to the actual I-25 uh, GAP project, and this would add the surface treatment and the faster um, funds to that project. 
Um, so with that, both TAC and RTC have recommended this to you, and I'd be happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll look for a motion. Second. Got a first and second. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? That is passed. Thank you very much, Mr. Kuchel. Next up is uh, item number 11, a discussion of appointments of the, to the finance and budget and performance and engagement committees. So attachment C, and that is uh, Director Jones. You did it. Um, so the nominating committee, if you'll recall, is myself, uh, George Teal, Nicholas Williams, Steve Conklin, Ron Wachowski, and Herb Atchison, and we met via phone for perhaps the world's fastest <laughs> nominating committee meeting, and, and one that I'm sure we enjoyed because of it, um, where we unanimously approved everyone who requested being on or staying on either the finance and budget or performance and engagement committees. And in case you haven't read that, that includes Larry Vidham, Wynn Shaw, Bob Roth, Heron, well, Larry and Wynn are on finance and budget, and then performance and engagement, Bob Roth, Aaron Brockett, David Beacom, Roger Hudson, Ashley Stilsman, and Herb Atchison. And I would also note that there are still space on both committees should anyone else like to be added tonight. Anyone would like to join these great committees that we do feed people too, so. Especially finance. Food brings everybody out. Finance now, is the place to be. This, we created these committees not only to, to provide better board engagement and oversight, but to really give people an opportunity to increase their involvement with the Dr. Cog um, team. And certainly if you ever want to be a board officer and eventually chair Dr. Cog, um, that's a great place to start your ascension to power. <laughs> and with that, I, I would make the motion. <laughs> To, uh, well, uh, and that's coming from a former chair, right? That's right. Okay. If I could put a motion on the table if you'd like. Yeah, please. So I'd move that we appoint the proposed slate of members to the Finance and Budget and Performance and Engagement Committees as previously mentioned. Second. Those in motion or uh, favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And no volunteers, huh? Okay. We'll come knocking. All right, next up, we have uh, item number 12, discussion of appointments of the Regional Transportation Committee, also known as the RTC, attachment D in your packet, uh, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I provided a description of the RTC last month, and it is quite unique to this region. Um, most MPOs do not have, they typically have a technical committee and a policy committee, which is also, in most cases, their, their board of directors. Um, this, this extra group is uh, quite very, like I said, quite unique to us, and I really like the concept. It basically, it brings uh, representatives from Dr. Cog, uh, CDOT, and RTD at the table, as well as some, um, some other special interests. There's business represented on there, environmental and, and the like. But it, it makes sure that the actions we take related to an MPO function, so our transportation function as an agency, that the other two agencies that by definition are part of the MPO, those being RTD and, and CDOT, um, are aware and uh, concur with those recommendations. So it's very different in that if, if RTC were to take a different action than what the board takes, then it has to go back through the cycle again until we arrive at consensus amongst the two groups. So it's, it's kind of cool, really. I think it's another check and balances that, uh, that, really, that really works in this region speaks to our collaboration. So the current members of RTC are Ron Murkowski and David Beacom, and the current alternates are George Teal, Teal Steve Odoricio, uh, Winshaw, Jim Dale, and Herb Atchison. Uh, Director Beacom, who unfortunately was unable to be here this evening, he has expressed an interest in continuing to serve as a member, and Directors Shaw, Peck, and San Sandgren also express interest in uh, serving as a member. So we'll have to do a little little uh, ballot here in a second. And also, um, uh, the currently designated alternates have also expressed an interest in staying on as alternates. And I hope those that, that are, were not successful in getting on RTC would consider being an alternate, because we can never have enough of those, to be quite honest with you. 
So, um, so Connie's going to pass around the uh, some uh, some cards, and if you would please jot down the uh, the two members that you want to serve on the RTC. Currently, from Dr. Cog, I'm I'm a I'm a standing member of that, as well as uh, the chair and vice chair. So, if you wouldn't mind choosing two people from uh, Director Beacom. Shaw, Peck, and Sandgren on your card. While we're doing that, we can probably go ahead and do the next item, if sure. you're fine with that, Mr. Chairman. We can come back Good. to we'll it. We'll come back. Uh, moving on to item 13, discussion of the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan amendments, attachment E in your packet. Uh, Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. So this item concerns uh, routine amendments to our 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. <clears throat> so just a reminder here, most of you have seen this slide before, just kind of reorientation of our overall Dr. Cog planning process, which starts with our MetroVision plan, which you'll hear in the next item. Um, and then the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, which helps implement MetroVision. And then the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan also sets uh, eligibility for the Transportation Improvement Program, which as you all know is where projects get, uh, get funded and implemented. So just a quick reminder, what is the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan? It really is our region's vision for our, in this case, 2040 uh, multimodal transportation future. You know, where, where do we want to invest? What types of projects, what types of services and programs in the transportation arena um, do we want to fund over the next 20 years through 2040? And I think what's important here, you know, Doug just talked about the Regional Transportation Committee and our relationship with, Dr. with uh, CDOT and RTD. You know, this plan is all encompassing. It's not just sort of what Dr. Cog's doing, it's what all of those agencies, local governments and others um, are funding towards transportation planning in the region. So along with the MetroVision plan and the Transportation Improvement Program. This is one of the foundational documents and one of the core functions of Dr. Cog in our MPO transportation role that Doug just spoke about is to uh, develop, uh, amend, and update this regional transportation plan. So we do a major update every four years and we do uh, sort of routine amendments uh, more frequently and that's what the subject is tonight, uh, sort of a routine amendment cycle to the 2040 plan. So we solicited amendments to both the transportation plan and to the MetroVision plan, which will be the next agenda item, uh, back in the fall of 2018 uh, and then have been working to process those amendments. Um, on the transportation side, this is a map showing the location of the project amendments that we received. Almost all of them relate to a planning process that Aurora has been undertaking called the Northeast Aurora Transportation Study, or the NEETS process. And through that process and through the city of Aurora's uh, beginning to implement uh, the recommendations of that process, they wanted to make some changes to our transportation plan uh, regarding several projects. So the map shows the locations of those projects. As you see in the lower left, it's really kind of three types of amendments. Uh, through that needs process, there were a few new projects that Aurora and its planning partners asked to add to the regional transportation plan, uh, a couple projects being removed, and then a couple projects uh, staying in the plan, but kind of changing their implementation timeframe uh, regarding our federal air quality conformity requirements. We also received a couple of amendments from the city of Thornton, which were frankly very minor, uh, relating to project limits uh, and completion of one project, which was good news, kind of ahead of schedule. And then one amendment from RTD regarding the North Metro end line. Um, RTD is not changing the schedule of the implementation of the end line, but in terms of meeting federal requirements of how we portray it uh, in the plan, we wanted to update uh, that portrayal as part of this amendment cycle. So this is a table and this is in your packet. I'm not gonna go through these projects individually, but these are basically the projects that you just saw on the map, both on this slide and then on this slide. And it basically just shows you, you know, what are these projects, where are they located, what's changing about these projects so that we can be transparent about the amendments to the plan. 
Um, as part of the um, public review period and the public hearing, we had a series of documents available uh, for the transportation plan so that folks could understand uh, what the proposed amendments are and how they would change uh, the transportation plan. Uh, so th these documents were the ones that were available. A summary document, you know, again, summarizing what were the amendments and, and uh, what are their effect of the amendments on the overall plan. Uh, the revised plan, if amended, and then the accompanying air quality conformity documents, which I'll talk about in a moment. So per our standard practice, uh, we had a 30-day public comment period, um, did a lot of notification uh, communication techniques to get the word out about the 30-day public review period, uh, culminating in a public hearing on April 17th uh, in front of this board. Uh, we did not receive any public comment either during the 30-day public comment period or during the public hearing. However, we did receive uh, several questions from board members during the public hearing about air quality emissions calculations and compliance, and I do want to talk about that for a minute. So uh, this is where I want to spend just a little bit of the time just to uh, kind of respond to some of what we heard uh, regarding our air quality conformity analysis. So just a reminder, uh, we need to address ozone, carbon monoxide, and what we call particulate matter, or PM10, uh, pollutants as part of uh, making changes to the regional transportation plan. We do that through motor vehicle emissions budgets that are established in the state implementation plan for air quality, known as the SIP. For ozone in particular, we talk about on-road versus other sources of, of pollutions. So we're focused on on-road motor vehicle emissions, and they're about 16% of volatile organic compounds and 31% of nitrous oxides, and those are human produced. Um, this air quality conformity analysis is regional in nature, so it's not project-based. It's based on the entirety of the transportation plan as proposed to be amended. The amendment changes are reflected in our regional travel model. And then emission modeling is based on our most recent planning assumptions, and this was part of the questions we received during the public hearing. So we look at things like demographics, transportation networks and services, vehicle fleet characteristics, and other components that go into the air quality conformity modeling. Um, that modeling is done by the Air Pollution Control Division at, at CDPHE for us. Um, in terms of sort of the big picture of the results of the modeling, uh, cleaner vehicles replacing older vehicles is really, and I'm going to show you a graph of this in a second, uh, in terms of what's improving our air quality conformity uh, performance in the plan over time. The farther out we get towards 2040, the better our emissions results look, and it really is that turnover in the fleet to cleaner vehicles. Um, as I think I've said, Dr. Cog conducts the model runs to produce vehicle miles travel, operating speeds, and other characteristics that we give to APCD, and then they complete the final emissions calculations. The results of that work must be uh, within or lower than the budgets established for us in the state implementation plan. So here's the punchline, the good news. Um, the 2040 uh, fiscally constrained regional transportation plan as proposed to be amended with the amendments that you saw passed all emissions budget tests. So just to show you a little bit of what that looks like, I mentioned that we, we uh, model for a couple things, volatile, volatile organic compounds, known as VOCs, and nitrous oxides. Um, so this graph shows kind of the same thing. It shows the horizontal bars at the top, shows the budgets, again, that are established for us through the state implementation plan, and then the, uh, the lines going from upper left to lower right on both of these show our emissions results based on the modeling work and how those results, as I mentioned, are improving for both of those as we get out to 2040. This table shows um, kind of the same thing for particulate matter, the PM10, and the carbon monoxide. Again, you see the budgets that we're being held to, and then the results of our emissions, and that our emissions results are lower than the budgets, which is what we need uh, to pass. So with that, um, both TAC and RTC uh, did recommend approval. We are looking for a motion tonight to approve, uh, adopt a resolution approving the amended transportation plan. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, Director uh, Jones. I, I just, I appreciate the additional explanation you gave around air quality, and I'm still sort of baffled at why we go through this process if every project always meets air quality conformity and we are getting more and more out of attainment 
uh, on ozone under the Clean Air Act, it, do it doesn't really match up. And so I appreciate the fact that we're following the process. I guess I would like to, to suggest that the process doesn't really work. And nothing against the projects that are being modeled. I'm just saying, you know, all the years being on Dr. Cog and we go through this and we check the boxes, but our air is not getting closer to attainment on ozone. And the number one source of ozone precursors is transportation in the metro area. So. And I, I appreciate the fact that by 2040, we'll all be driving electric vehicles and the air will be cleaner, but that's over 20 years away and we're gonna be downgraded to serious non-attainment. So I just would encourage staff to work with CDPHE in calling and wondering whether or not there's a better way to really set budgets around you know, this process or do modeling um, that really reflects the reality that we're we're in because this seems fictitious, I guess. And no, nothing personal. I appreciate all the good staff work. I'm just the process doesn't make sense. <laughs> Not personal at all. I guess let me try to clarify because it is admittedly confusing. Uh, so let's see if I get this right. And I have our air quality expert with me to to help. Um, so Director Jones is raising a very important issue, which is that. You know, look, we're struggling to we're struggling to attain uh, on the standards for ozone. So, how is it that things can look so rosy in the transportation plan? I think the distinction that I want to make here is that in the regional transportation plan, we are charged with looking at on-road mobile source emissions, and that is one piece of the pie of the total sort of emissions or the total picture of air quality. Um, there's what are known as mobile sources, both on-road mobile sources that we're talking about here. There's off-road mobile sources, things like airplanes, boats, um, other, you know, other forms of transportation that aren't on-road. And then, of course, there's a larger sort of what we call point sources of, of pollution, um, everything from oil and gas to lawn mowers to solvents, you know, things that come in a can that smell is kind of a good way to think about it. The point is that there's a whole universe of things that go into that overall sort of standard that Director Jones correctly notes that we're struggling to attain. But in the regional transportation plan, we're only looking at one piece of it. We're looking at on-road mobile source emissions. Um, and when you look at that piece of the pie and the federal requirements that we have around that piece of the pie, we are able to meet that component of air quality conformity. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, looking for a motion. Mm -hmm. Have a motion? Do I, do I have a second? Second. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Motion carries. Go back to item 12 around the appointments of the RTC. So the members will be, well, Pfeiffer and Dyack were automatically members, but the motion will need to include the next two members, which will be Beacom and Shaw, and the alternates will be Peck, Sangren, Teal, Dell, and Atchison. So if I can have a motion to approve the membership. So moved. Got a motion, got a second. second. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions, carries, welcome. All right, let's keep on moving, we're making progress. Item 14 on the agenda, discussion of the amendments to the Metrovision, attachment F in your packet. Mr. Colvert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me get this loaded up here. I will offer a very quick presentation, largely to sort of reorient you uh, to this topic. It is something that you've heard uh, in the past few months. Um, but I will also mention there are a few things in your packet uh, that might be helpful. There is a link to um, all of the amendments that were proposed during the Metrovision assessment process, both sponsor uh, initiated as well as staff uh, initiated. Also within the memo is within that attachment section, sort of a, a link to a red line version of the plan so that you would have a sense of actually how these proposals would ultimately be uh, reflected within the, within the document. <laughs> Um, just to, uh, again, a, a quick uh, refresher. Um, so the Metrovision plan was unanimously adopted by the Board of Directors back in January of 2017. Uh, 
even prior to this version of MetroVision, there's been a long-standing principle that the plan is reviewed uh, frequently, right? So the board is committed to doing annual uh, sort of contemplations about what, what might need to change within the plan and larger revisions uh, le less frequently. So not surprising, based on that principle, uh, this is a conversation that was uh, something you also had about this time uh, last year. Uh, as Jacob mentioned, there's, there is a connection between the RTP amendments and the MetroVision amendments. Um, we really try to keep these things together, frankly, until adoption, because it can get really clunky to write the perfect resolution that that, that brings both of these things together. So that's why we we have the, the call for amendments happens at the same time, the deadline is typically at the same time, um, all those sorts of things. So that's why these actions are separate, just to maybe make the action a little bit simpler. I will point on this slide that there are two things that we do in the MetroVision amendment process that are a little unique from the RTP amendment process. Uh, so one of the more common uh, sponsor-initiated amendments that we see is related to urban centers. So the, the plan identifies and recognizes uh, urban centers throughout the region. Uh, the, the board has previously directed staff to have a process where there is a staff review of, of, that, of those submittals as well as uh, an evaluation panel. So an evaluation panel uh, meets along with Arcticog staff to review all urban center uh, proposals that come in the door and then ultimately the board sees a recommendation that is uh, from both of those groups. Uh, and then the other thing that we do that's a little unique is uh, we uh, have a practice if there is a staff initiated uh, amendment that we're suggesting related to performance measures uh, or targets, we bring that to the board ahead of time before it gets released for public review and comment so that you can weigh in before the public has a chance uh, to weigh in. So we did that again uh, this time uh, as well. And as with, uh, as Jacob mentioned, there was a public hearing um, on the on the amendments uh, back in April. Uh, as with the, the RTP, we did not receive any public comment on, an, on any of the uh, proposals that were uh, provided to the public. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a summary document that gives way more detail on this set of sort of staff initiated uh, uh, suggestions related to performance measures. Bottom line, it's about better data came uh, came to light that ultimately impacted the baseline associated with these measures. And we had a conversation with the board uh, back in, I believe, March about how that might impact uh, a, a future target as well. So again, better data came available to us and, and we, we brought that forward to the board previously and then obviously shared those uh, recommendations with the public uh, as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, on the urban center side, uh, as, as noted on the slide, uh, there were, and in the, in the memo, there were 10 proposals that we received as part of the amendment process. There are five that are moving forward uh, to you uh, with, a, with a recommendation from staff um, and the evaluation panel. Uh, these are for four boundary adjustments, uh, one actually sort of a shrinking of the urban center and four expansions, I mean three expansions, uh, as well as a new uh, urban center uh, in Commerce City. Uh, so this obviously comes with a recommendation from uh, recommendation from staff uh, to approve the MetroVision plan uh, as amended. Uh, there is a proposed motion as well as a res resolution in your packet. Happy to take any questions uh, from the board. Questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion. So moved. I have a first and a second. All in favor? Who made the motion in the back there? Okay. Oh, hi. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you very much. Moving right along to number 15, discussion of public engagement plan, attachment G. I, is this Ms. Ms. Hood? Oh, it's close. The U throws me. <laughs> I know, it doesn't make any sense. Hi everybody, I'm Lisa Hood. I'm the public engagement specialist here at Dr. Cog. And I was last here in March for our public hearing for this public engagement plan. So I'm just gonna go quickly through the slides because like the last few presentations, they're all things that you've seen before. Um, but I do wanna just remind folks of just a few main points. So first, why are we updating the public engagement plan? Um, well, first and foremost, it's a federal requirement for us to have a public participation plan. The one that we have uh, was last updated in 2010, so it's a bit out of date and definitely due for an update. We also got some recommendations in our most recent uh, quadrennial review of the Unified Planning Work Program of places where we could improve that participation plan. And then we wanted to take that opportunity to really extend our public participation plan beyond just our transportation planning functions at Dr. Cog to really all of the different work that we do. 
And most importantly, we wanted to be much more intentional and about having meaningful public involvement in all of the work that we do to go beyond just checking the federal requirement boxes. So over the past year or so, we've been updating the plan. We started off by reviewing some best practices from peer organizations around the country. Every MPO is required to have a public participation plan, so there's lots to look at. Um, we had a very iterative, iterative review with all of our different departments here at Dr. Cog. It was really led by the communications and marketing department, which is my department. Um, and then we're here for adoption tonight, hopefully. Uh, we had a public comment period. As you know, we had the public hearing on March 20th. The, documents, the document was up for about uh, two months prior to that. It was advertised in the Denver Post, on social media, through our website and our newsletters, and I think that you all helped promote that as well. We also sent it to the FHWA and FTA for some informal feedback because they had had those recommendations for the public participation plan to make sure that we were on the, the right track. So I really want to focus my time in this presentation on the changes to the document that have been made since the public hearing. Um, and really the most significant ones were in response to the recommendations that we got from the FHWA. And what they had recommended was just some clarifications about how our evaluation process of public engagement will inform future processes. And then they also really recommended that we had um, a more public facing couple of pages in the beginning of the document. So if you take a look at the document, we've got a few more pages that just explain if somebody from the public were to pick up this guide, even though it's really written for Dr. Cog's staff, how could they get involved with our processes? We also made a few other changes to address some of the co public comment that we received as well as some just typos and clarifications that we found upon further review. And then one of the big changes was that we redesigned the document so that it includes a lot more visual aids um, for any type of user that might pick up the document. And if you're, more, if you're interested in more details about those changes, they're all summarized in the matrix. Most of them are fairly minor, fairly minor other than the ones I mentioned. And this is my final slide just kind of to keep this in mind, the intent of the plan. So it really serves as a guidebook for staff to plan and implement effective public engagement across all of the work functions of Dr. Cog, as well as it's a statement of our um, commitment to that meaningful engagement. And there's really three main highlights of the plan, which I've talked about before, but we have guiding principles for all of our public engagement. We have steps to engagement, so that really standardizes the engagement process along all of the different things that we do. And then there are these appendices, which are really kind of the heart of the document that create kind of a toolkit for staff to use when planning those public engagement activities. So we took this to the TAC and the RTC. They've both recommended approval. And there is a motion for you in your packet. And I can take any questions that you might have. Any questions or comments for Ms. Hood? Seeing none, looking for a motion to approve the draft public engagement plan. The first and second. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Moving right along. Item number 16, discussion of the community mobility planning and implementation for fiscal year 2020-2021, set asides in the 2020-2023 transportation improvement program. I can't wait till we pass those years. Attachment H, and it looks like it's gonna be Mr. Webb and Lindsay, a couple of you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Derek Webb. Um, I'm a planner here at Dr. Cog. I'm joined by uh, Emily Lindsay, who's gonna be co-presenting uh, with me on this, uh, this new set aside, the Community Mobility Planning and Implementation set aside. Um, we've been working probably about the last six to eight months uh, trying to develop what this set aside could, could do, could be, um, and how it would work. Uh, we've worked with um, several uh, internal uh, stakeholders, different divisions within Dr. Cog, uh, as well as um, some external um, um, potential interested parties and in, 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 um, local governments or sponsors that might be interested in, in actually uh, applying for this type of set aside. Um, in addition to um, you know the, the multiple presentations we've given to TAC as information items and, and the RTC, uh, we also did hold uh, two 
kind of teaser webinars uh, early on in the process, again, to have more detailed conversations with uh, those, those potential sponsors that might, might be interested in applying, just to see if we were headed down the right path, if it was something of interest, if, if there were projects that might already be a kind of a top of mind uh, within those local jurisdictions uh, that, that could fit in, into the direction that we were headed. Um, so what we've brought uh, before you today is the uh, eligibility rules, the draft eligibility rules and the selection process that we're thinking of. Uh, we're just gonna walk you uh, pretty quickly through kind of the overall idea and how it would work and, and uh, see how we can take it from here. Um, in general, the, the purpose is to support planning and small infrastructure projects uh, that contribute to the implementation of outcomes. Uh, key outcomes within MetroVision and the MetroVision uh, Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, the program goals that you see listed here uh, come directly out of MetroVision. It's kind of the key ones that we felt uh, really um, spoke to uh, what the, we felt the intent of this, this new set-aside was. Um, in terms of funding availability and requirements, um, really there's this, this one set-aside has kind of two pots of, uh, of funding within it. One side of it is the planning side, um, and the other side is small infrastructure. We're tr really trying to link um, thoughtful planning with um, kind of the implementation of some of the outcomes that, that come out of that, that planning process. Um, in terms of planning, there's uh, $1 million uh, slated for the FY 2020 and FY 2021 cycle. Um, on the other side, the small infrastructure side, there's 2.3 million um, roughly available. Uh, we do, you know, we're gonna state out there that, that there is the possibility that these funds uh, could change a little bit, these totals could change a little bit, just, you know, if for some reason we have some funds that get returned and potentially get rolled into this. Um, but we don't see it changing that much, if at all. Um, applicants uh, are, uh, uh, do have the ability to uh, request funding for up to two years, so there, multiple uh, applications are allowed. Um, and um, at this moment, and, and kind of how we've been uh, working this through with the with TAC and NRTC and our, our internal external stakeholders, is we have not recommended any uh, funding minimums or maximums. We're really interested in seeing what um, local sponsors uh, what, pro what they think their projects might actually cost rather than kind of setting an arbitrary limit and, and everybody kind of just targeting that, that amount of funding. Um, because of, of the fact that we've kind of indicated that there's no um, mins or maxes uh, on that funding request, uh, there was a concern uh, early on that, you know, what if a, a single entity came in with a bunch of uh, projects that were really high quality, really great, um, and, and had the potential to blow everybody out of the water and, and kind of take up the entire pot of uh, funding. Uh, so we've added that, um, you know, to, to introduce some equity and, and um, uh, some fairness to the, to the uh, funding, um, that uh, a single entity will not be awarded more than 50% of available funds by category. Um, and then on top of that, uh, of course, uh, like all of our federal funding and set-asides, uh, there is a local cash match required of 17.21%. Um, I do wanna add, uh, just to break down the planning and the small infrastructure side of things uh, a little bit further, planning, um, what we're envisioning in terms of the planning side of things are things like neighborhood level plans. Um, you know, it, most, most of you are probably still familiar with the stamp or the stationary master plan and urban center um, set aside that uh, kind of sunsetted it in FY19. Um, those types of projects would still technically be eligible um, as, as well as kind of next step studies where um, you know there's been a previous planning effort within a local uh, community um, where they, they just need a little bit more planning to take just you know the step further to get closer to um, some implementation ideas. Um, I will add that on the planning side, we're not really focused on a geographic kind of stipulation. We're really looking toward local governments uh, or, or, and or sponsors to, to really hone in on, on priority areas um, and tell us where, where the areas are. Not to say that station areas and urban centers are no longer eligible. Uh, again, just trying to open up and, and, and see what sponsors feel are, are priorities within their jurisdictions. Um, in terms of the small infrastructure side of things, these are things like, um, let's see, pedestrian crossings, sidewalks, wayfinding, uh, bicycle travelways, and bicycle parking would all kind of fit into that to give you an idea of the difference between the planning and the, the small infrastructure side of things. Um, this program, we are moving forward with a, a two-step application process. Um, really, this is a, a letter of intent and then an application. Emily's gonna jump into kind of how that, how that works on the, the proposed timeline moving forward if this is approved. 
Um, but the letter of intent is really, you know, one to two page document that really just kind of gives Dr. Cog's staff an idea or a general understanding of what the, the applicant is thinking about doing so that we can kind of have a, a conversation up front before a lot of time and energy is spent uh, putting together, together an application that may, may or may not um, be competitive in the end of, uh, of things. Uh, after the letter of intent, um, you know, if everything, those conversations go smoothly and, and, um, and there is a, a competitive application kind of um, suggested, uh, applicants would be invited to apply with a full application. And with that, I'm gonna let Emily kind of get into more of the details of that whole process and how it gets into the timeline. So, thank you. Thanks, Derek. So we've been working collaboratively on this set aside, so it's exciting to be able to present this together to you guys today. So just to give you an idea of the application process, um, we will start, as we do most of our TIP set-asides, with a mandatory application workshop. And this is particularly important in this set-aside since it's a new set-aside and a kind of a new process to get folks together in the same room, give them an outline about what is expected um, throughout the process and a little bit more information about the overall um, funding opportunity. Um, and then after that, is the mic coming up? It does, okay, sorry. Um, and after that, is it dying? Okay. Anyway, after that, we're going to work with uh, project sponsors to identify the concepts and begin early discussions with Dr. Cog's staff. We've actually already talked to several communities across the region about their interest in this particular set aside. So we can really do that whenever you've, your staff has an idea. They're welcome to reach out to us. And then following that, we'll ask for folks to submit a letter of intent. Again, like Derek said, that's that first step in that process. And staff will discuss the letter of intent um, with the applicants, and then applicants will be invited to apply and fill out that full application with all of the details. And then the traditional project review and scoring of the applications will occur, and Dr. Krog will bring that forth through the committee process. Um, as we do with all of our set-aside projects, so you all will see that again um, before applicants are notified. Okay, so that was the process. And then I just wanted to give you an overview of the evaluation criteria, which are also in your packet if you want to dig into that. Um, we did model it after the TIP scoring um, and evaluation criteria, so you'll see some similarities with that there. We're interested in learning a little bit more about the project types. Uh, again, since this opportunity really links planning with small infrastructure implementation, we want to see those connections. And then um, partnerships and collaboration. Again, looking at multi-agency or multi-jurisdictional project collaboration, we love to see those projects um, through, funded through these set-asides. We'll also look at innovation and transferability. So this will look to see if there's any best practice development, toolkit development, things that other folks across the region can use um, once the deliverables are completed. And then uh, two and three, alignment with CMPI set-aside goals. Those are those five that Derek talked about earlier. And then the general alignment with MetroVision. All right. So RTC and the TAC have both seen this and recommended approval. So all things pending tonight's outcome, I just wanted to give you an idea of the tentative schedule moving forward. So we are ready to go to issue a call for projects for that letter of intent phase as, as soon as we have approval of the criteria. And then we will give folks about four weeks to fill out that letter of intent and to work with staff to develop that. Um, we'll meet with folks um, you know, on a rolling basis as those letters are submitted. Uh, we'll also have a mandatory application workshop in early June so that folks have a little bit of time between when we issue the call and when the letters are due. And then once we meet to talk about the letters of intents, we will uh, invite folks to fill out the full application. And again, we'll give folks another four weeks or so to fill out those. So we're looking at kind of the final deadline in late July. So that is all for now, but we're happy to take questions. Any questions for the for the team? Hi. Oh, oh sorry. Go See you over there. Am I am I up? Yep, you're up. Thank you. Can you give some examples of projects that were awarded last year or the past couple of years? So this is a brand new set aside. We kind of took some ideas um, from the former TDM 
set aside for the small infrastructure projects, so those multimodal type projects, we awarded some bike lanes, some first last mile connections to transit on that side with the former urban center stamp set aside. And Derek, do you wanna give some examples? Sure. So, so it's not technically a one-to-one -one relationship. You know, we didn't just pull everything from the stamp and, and UC process and the TDM process. Kind of tried to, to uh, create a new program that uh, kind of uh, reflected things that we had heard or, or the new direction that, that we were kind of being directed to, to head to. Um, but, you know, in the past for the, the stationary master plan or urban center uh, studies, these, these are studies looking at, um, you know, multimodal, uh, how to incorporate multimodal um, transportation options within urban centers, connecting urban centers, that type of thing. There have been um, wayfinding uh, studies, oh, um, a whole slew of different types. Um, but, but in that program, it was specifically focused on stationaries and, and urban centers. Um, in this, we're kind of opening it up for any type of priority growth area, that type, type of thing. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, I'll look for a motion for approving the uh, eligibility rules and selection process. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Motion carries. Moving on to item 17, discussion of the 20. Oh, it's the big, the big thing now here. I see what's going on here. Yeah. This is a moment of truth for all of us at the table. No, discussion of the 2020, 20, 23 Sub-Regional Transportation Improvement Program Funding Attachment I in your packet. Mr. Curchell. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and good evening, everyone, again. Uh, so if you recall last month, um, I was up here and going to be giving a very similar presentation to what you heard last month. But I think most importantly is that you heard from each of the eight sub-regional forums. And they were describing the, the project recommendations that they were making and also the projects that they had placed on their waiting list. Uh, at that time, a month ago, we were not looking for any action. It was just an informational briefing to kind of introduce you to this topic. Uh, this evening, we'll, we will be asking for a recommendation to place um, each of the forum's projects and their waiting list into the draft tip. Um, so just as a summary of the sub-regional share process, uh, at the close of the regional process late last year, the sub-regional process was opened for eight weeks earlier this year, ending on February 27th. Um, so those applications were due to each of the forums instead of Dr. Cog. So over that time throughout March into early April, each of those technical committees and forums really went through the process, their scoring process, and uh, deliberated and recommended the projects that you see and the waiting lists that you see contained within attachment one. And that, again, like, that, like I said, that will be um, subject of the action this evening. Uh, so a summary of um, the projects and everything that's contained within attachment one is contained in this table um, on, this, on this slide. A total of 113 projects uh, were submitted along uh, throughout the eight forums, uh, totaling $385 million. Although we would have liked to fund it, all of them, we were only able to fund 82 of them. And those 82 projects uh, are yield over a half billion dollars in total transportation investment for the region. Um, Along with this new process, um, I think I should say one of, one of the things that came out of this new process was collaboration, or more collaboration than, one than what there used to be in the past. So seven projects of those 82 actually um, came from more than, some re one, more than one sub region. So the next few slides really talk about not just the sub regional process, but talk about the, the regional and the sub regional projects as a whole. Uh, but first, I just wanted to, to kind of back up and summarize um, where our funding is coming from, a uh, total of $330 million over four years that was available for this TIP cycle. Uh, so the first is Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, or STBG. Uh, for those who have been around a while, uh, this is what was formerly called STP Metro. And I know personally, I still call SDP Metro on occasion, so you'll hear that slip up. But this is our most flexible program that we have, providing $134.1 million. 
A set aside out of that STPG program is a program called Transportation Alternatives, or the TA program. Um, again, historically, this was called uh, STP Enhancement, for those who recall, and this primarily funds bike and ped infrastructure projects, uh, a total of just over $10 million for this four-year cycle. The largest block of our, our funding, um, over 40%, comes from the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality, or CMAC funds. Uh, program or um, projects and programs that are funded with CMAC funds must provide an air quality benefit um, by reducing emissions and congestion. Uh, a couple of major exceptions that uh, projects that cannot be funded with CMAC include ro roadway capacity and reconstruction projects. Uh, and finally, what is new for Dr. Cog for this tip cycle is a state funding source of, that came out of the Senate Bill 1 from 2018, uh, multi Multimodal Transportation Options Funds, or MMOF. Um, the eligibility types include transit, TDM programs, multimodal um, mobility projects, um, studies, bike and ped projects. Um, the big thing with this funding type is it does require a 50% match. So carrying on with the regional and the sub-regional projects combined, uh, we took a look at um, how the funding allocation by project categories is split out. Uh, so just a couple things um, to point out. Um, Dr. Cog is introducing a new project category called multimodal. And multimodal essentially is a project that contains both a bike pad and a transit element. Um, another thing of note are the bicycle um, and pedestrian investments of a little over $51 million. Uh, and this is uh, high, a little higher than a typical tip cycle. When, again, we take a look at the regional and sub-regional projects and we look at the percentage by project type, uh, a couple of tidbits that kind of stand out. Uh, first is bicycle and pedestrian projects uh, come in at 30% of the total. Um, historically, this is around 20%. And when you combine the bike pad, transit, and multimodal, it totals up 50% of the total, um, total projects by type. Uh, and finally, just uh, uh, some information on the remaining schedule. Um, we, this, um, this evening, will be looking for your action to place these sub-regional projects into the draft tip. Approximately a month from now, we will release the, uh, the draft tip document along with the air quality conformity documents. Um, that, those will be available for a month, concluding um, at your July board meeting for the public hearing. Uh, then we will start right in with the um, TAC, RTC, and finally concluding at your August board meeting for action to approve the draft tip and the conformity documents. So that's all I have this evening. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. Any questions or comments for Mr. Cottrell? Oh, seeing none, I'll look for... Oh. Did you want to say something? I'll look for a motion to approve the sub-regional uh, share projects and rank, rank, ranked order waiting list to be included in the draft. I'll move. Second. Second. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstention. That carries. Good job, everybody, and thank you, staff, for all your long days and hard work around that. Mr. Chairman, if I yes. may. Mr. X. Thank you, sir, very much. I, I held my tongue last month when we talked about this, and I know many, many people did, and we all know this, this process was not without its apprehension, right? Uh, that extends from staff all the way down to you all, I'm sure. Uh, I, I hope you, you know, I, I, I really do feel that um, at least on the collaboration side that it, it was uh, probably exceeded my expectations. I had pretty high expectations for it, so I'm very proud of that. But I would like to just point out a few people in this whole process, because again, this was brand new to us, and uh, we were a little, little worried at times. I would like to point out um, first the members of the um, what was first the TIP review work group, and then that morphed into the TIP policy work group. That group met over 20, or sorry, over 50 times to develop the, uh, the process, the policy, and all that kind of good stuff. And several of those members are here today, and those are members of your staff. Um, they were uh, representatives from our Transportation Advisory Committee, or TAC. And um, so thank you all very much. That was a lot, a lot of work that you guys did on that, and we appreciate Dr. Cog's staff. 
um, for your level of commitment to getting to where we are today. So thank you. Dr. Cogstaff, obviously, um, tremendous job. I would like to point out specifically Todd Cottrell and the work that he's done. Um, I'll tell you what, he's been, he's been a real trooper in this, and I think staff from your, your uh, jurisdictions would, would say the same. He's been fabulous. Um, to attend, now we split up, you know, going to some of these uh, sub-regional forum meetings, and we, we were at all those, but Todd was at most of them. And uh, so, sir, thank you very much. We really do appreciate your time and effort. Last but not least, I just want to point, we're not over the finish line yet. We still got to approve the full tip, and that's coming up at the August meeting. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for, for the time. Thank you. Yes, Director Jones. Um, I uh, Just following up on your comments, um, it was a new process, and um, it, I, I think it would be great if we could sort of debrief uh, on a more specific level. In, in many ways, it worked great, and there's also opportunities for improvement as well. And I know uh, coming out of our sub-regional process, we have a number of suggestions to further tweak this. And uh, just wondered if you've already put some thought into that and how we might have that conversation. Yes, no, thank you for bringing that up. I, I, I was remiss in uh, mentioning that. So, you know, this part of the process, we <laughs> there was quite a bit of convincing to allow F, F, uh, to allow of FHWA to allow us to do this process. And um, we committed that this is a pilot project for us. And we committed to them to in establishing a white paper, evaluating the whole process. And that, in turn, will include the opportunity for a lot of input from, from all you, you know, everybody in this room and others um, about how you believe that process went, where there are areas of improvement, whether, quite frankly, we should do it again. And I think those are all things that we'll factor, you know, factor in when we look at the next HIP cycle. Um, so, yes, so, so plan on that. That is, that is a work program item that we will be doing in the uh, uh, not-so-distant future, probably be in the fall when we do that. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll move, move on to the informational briefings. The annual fast track status report, attachment J in your packet. Mr. Van Meter, please. I don't have, like, what is it? Music to play while it comes up to the plate, right? <laughs> there you go. Do I get to pick, do I get to pick the music though? The walk up music, yeah. <laughs> I heard Crazy Train popped in my head when I asked about it. I can't help it. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Um, so, good evening, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to present this 2019 Fast Track Status Report. I um, want to recap progress on the program today, just real briefly go through the accomplishments to date. We opened the West Corridor, part of the Fast Tracks plan in 2013, Denver Union Station in 2014, the free metro ride also in 2014. The Flatiron Flyer, that's US 36 Bus Rapid Transit in 2016. The University of Colorado A-Line in 2016. The B-Line from DUS to Westminster in 2016. The R-Line in 2017. The G-Line just a few weeks ago. Yay. Yay. <laughs> And of course, another Fast Tracks project is opening this coming Friday, the Southeast Corridor Extension, the E, F, and R lines. One other fast, major Fast Tracks project is also under construction. That's the North Metro Commuter Rail Line, which will be named the N Line from Denver Union Station to 124th. Testing on this project began in March of this year, and we're on track for an opening in the year 2020. However, as noted in the report, and well known among our stakeholders, including those around the table here tonight, 
there are four fast tracks projects or sections of projects that still remain to be funded. They include the central corridor extension from 30th and Downing to 38th and Blake. Estimated cost in 2017 dollars is about $150 million. The Southwest Corridor Extension um, at an estimated cost in 2017 dollars of about $180 million. The Northwest Rail Completion from Westminster to Longmont at about $1.5 billion and the North Metro completion from 124th to State Highway 7, estimated cost, again, and all of these are in 2017 dollars, of about $290 million. So more details on the status of all these projects are included in the report that's attached to tonight's agenda. What I wanna kind of delve into a little bit more right now, though, is this note that I made last month during my monthly report, and that is that RTD staff and board remain committed to finishing all of the projects in the voter-approved Fast Tracks program. On, in fact, on April 16th, 2019, just last month, the RTD Board of Directors approved an action entitled board commitment to fast tracks completion and peak service plan. So I wanna spend a couple minutes running through some of the details on what that board resolution says and is directing staff to do. Specifically, the resolution expresses the board's acknowledge, acknowledgement of RTD's legal responsibility to complete the unfinished fast tracks corridors and its intention to do so in as expeditious a manner as possible. Addressing the financial challenges facing RTD in completing this task, the resolution expresses the board's directives to staff to investigate reasonable cost-saving measures and to propose funding mechanisms to construct and operate the unfinished fast tracks corridors, those that I just enumerated a few moments ago with a report of steps taken to appropriately move forward to be provided within two months of that date, which was mid-April. Further addressing the financial challenges, the resolution also dictates that staff will proceed in a commercially responsible manner, no, commercially reasonable manner to be precise, um, to explore, analyze, fund, and facilitate construction and operation of a cost-saving measure for the unfinished Northwest Rail Corridor that is presently being evaluated by staff and stakeholders, referred to as the Peak Service Plan. A report outlining proposed steps to appropriately move forward with this plan will also be required and submitted from staff to the RTD Board within two months. So I'll um, let you know we've had a number of meetings, we being staff at RTD, financial planning, capital programs, working towards preparation of that report and delivery to our board of directors and to public and stakeholders in mid-June. That concludes my summary of the report presented to you. I am open to questions. Yes. Thank you. Um, I actually have a request on the end line title. If you can just go back at, on page 97, um, can we add something in there that shows that it's not a complete project? Maybe end line to 124th? Because as it states on that page, it looks like it's the completed project, but as you just mentioned, it's actually not. Very appropriate. Yes, I will make that note. That's information that's also presented uh, in some of our public facing materials. So I'll make sure that we get that note, note that it's 224th, not the complete project. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Van Meter. Thank you. Next up, uh, informational briefings from the committee reports. Uh, report from the stack, Director Jones. So at our April meeting, we received an update on CDOT's new organizational structure. 
And a couple of changes were made. The transportation system management and operations were, was moved into the updated division of maintenance and operations, which will also include the ITS um, safety and operations. The Office of Traffic and Safety returned to the Division of Engineering, where it used to be, and Central 70 will also be in the Engineering Division so that there's a more direct engagement with the Chief Engineer. And then uh, Sophie Schulman will lead the new Office of Innovative Mobility, which includes the Division of Transit and Rail, as well as uh, Advanced Mobility and Electrification Programs. So, some changes at CDOT. And then I think I mentioned the last time that um, CDOT is doing a new planning reset process, and we sort of dove deeper into the details around that. Re Rebecca led us in that discussion, um, specifically about talked about CDOT's upcoming statewide transportation plan and regional transportation process. The themes around that are connections, choice, and Colorado for all. And the public process is already underway. The plans are to have meetings in all 64 counties. Um, over the summer, and, and this is going to be a pretty fast process. Um, so hopefully, I think they're trying to, to reach a conclusion by the uh, end of the fall. Is that right? Early fall. Oh, early fall. And as I mentioned last time, the goal is to um, have a better statewide understanding of local priorities and needs so that they can put that into a 10-year data-driven strategic pipeline of projects. So again, a refresh on where we are. Um, and then also at Stack, we had a preview of the 4P meeting presentation that CDOT's going to be holding in the regions, and also saw the MetroQuest web survey that they're going to be using as an online public engagement tool to maximize public input into this new uh, planning reset. Thank you, Director Jones. Um, Metro mayors, which mayor wants to do that if they were there? <coughs> You only have two years darker or to me? Okay, we'll skip. Okay. Metro Area County Commissioners, Mr. Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Last month we had a, a joint presentation by Boulder County County and Douglas County on mental health services that are being provided for counties. So as we all know, this seems to be a, a pretty oh, topic to be handling, and Boulder County is doing some phenomenal things at all levels, and it care of the whole group, and the same thing with Douglas County, so it's just we continue to have that, and we actually, it's such an importance, it'll be in our one of our fall meetings, it'll be another joint venture, I believe, by Denver and the other counties, and I can't Great presentation on mental health that is uh, health services that are occurring at all levels. Thank you, Director Partridge. Next up, uh, the Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, Ms. Sanchez Warren. Good evening. The Advisory Committee on Aging had a speaker from the Governor's Strategic Action Planning Group on Aging. They talked about their strategic plan for 2000. Uh, 1920. They're focusing on three areas, including health care reform, uh, workforce, uh, and the, there's a huge lack of workforce, as you probably know, but it's really impacting the health care and the elder sector, um, and then transportation. We also had a presentation um, or a briefing on our own um, Latino case management program. The Latino elder population is the next baby boom in the metropolitan area. Um, there are a lot of Latino area aging uh, folks coming down the pike. We don't serve them well now. We're learning how to serve them. We've been working really hard on developing, having Spanish-speaking staff. So we have Spanish-speaking staff in, in case management and information and uh, assistance in our Medicare and benefits program. Uh, in our options counseling program and in our veterans program. So we've done a really good job of having, and someone can actually answer our Spanish line in Spanish, which is also very helpful. Um, I know my name is Sanchez, but my, um, my professor in college would say, caramba, Sanchez, because my Spanish is so bad. Um, <laughs> 
In fact, when my mother-in-law was in her last um, days, she reverted to Spanish. That was not helpful. Um, <laughs> it was hard to know what she needed. Um, uh, and and then we also had a presentation on our veterans transportation program and how uh, we're evolving that. Um, uh, it's a really cool system that I'd like to present to you in the next couple of months where we'll be able to coordinate trips from different providers in a much more efficient manner. I also want to share with you something we got you all, we, the collective we, got a thank you from um, some of the most vulnerable people we serve. We fund um, an organization called Senior Support Services. They are a day shelter for homeless, uh, primarily men, and it's a place for them to go during the day and get services and food and education, um, a place to just sit and rest. About 40% of these guys are veterans. They've had histories in their youth of addiction and drug use. They have problems with post-traumatic stress disorder. Now they're aging, and it's hard to be homeless and aging. I want you to see this, because they send this to us. It says, thanks, Dr. Cobb, oh. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, and you know, the great work your team does for the region, and in fact, we've been talking earlier about having Jayla uh, more of a permanent spot into our agenda versus putting her at the end of our informational briefings. For those that don't know, I mean, that is a major part of what Dr. Cog does in our region, and uh, we need to uh, spend some, be more informed and engaged in that area of our business, so. Good job, Jayla and her team. Moving on to uh, uh, Regional Air Quality Council, Mr. Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. Before I begin, don't forget, sign up for t-shirts along the left-hand wall there as you leave. Steve's gonna leave this store open for, for 15 minutes or so afterwards. Um, okay, Rack. so we introduced, we have, we've had some new board members lately. We got some folks rolling off, um, including council, uh, council member uh, Kendra Black's a new, new, new member of RAC. Uh, Director Flynn, I didn't know if you knew that or not, so that, that was kind of nice to see her. Um, we recognized uh, our very own Director Elise Jones for her decade of service on the rack. Oh. She's now, right? <laughs> Onwards and upwards now to bigger and greater things at the AQCC, so I know you guys are you're, you're busy over there. I, I, that I know. So thank you for, all, for your involvement with rack through the years, Elise. Um, we've had we had a couple presentations. Uh, one uh, Boulder Air Quality monitor, Monitoring Study from the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research from, from the University of Colorado. That was that was quite interesting. I'm not even going to suggest I knew what the heck he was talking about, but stuff I did I thought was kind of cool. And we also had this other uh, presentation from um, from a gentleman. His name is, is Mark Roberts with Empowering Colorado. Has anybody heard of this group? They're, they're, it's basically, um, it's, it's kind of an up and coming thing. It's, it's a nonprofit news outlet. And um, I, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, written, you know, some, some newspaper type stuff. And you familiar with this at all? So it's basically, you know, it, it's the first one I think of its kind within the state of Colorado, but it's getting pretty popular on the East Coast. So he, was, he came and he's really focused in all facets of energy. So that's why he, he presented to the, to the RAC. So that's it. That's my report. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. RAC. Moving on to E-470 Authority, Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we, the E-470 Authority Board of Directors met on May 9th. Uh, last Thursday. Um, we heard from the finance department. They did engage in a annual audit. That annual audit was, um, I, I forget the phrase for a, a good audit without exception. Clean. Say that again? Clean. <laughs> it was clean. So that was good to hear for the first time uh, attending a board of directors meeting. Um, and then uh, finance presented some of the metrics that they're following. It's uh, obviously as a toll authority, they're not only measuring 
the expenditures, like a lot of us do with our public works, but also the income that they're bringing in. It was really rather fascinating. We heard from the IT department, um, uh, Mr. Flynn. It seems that the E-470 Authority is also going into the cloud with their call center. And so we got to hear <laughs> the ins and outs uh, of implementing a cloud application. And the board did um, vote to award uh, contract, uh, award the contract. Um, we did uh, hear from the operations department on a other uh, an additional contract that the board did approve. We heard from engineering and roadway maintenance, um, a contract for pavement marking. And uh, one of the board members uh, did mention at the time, it's amazing the amount of uh, cost involved just to lay paint on the road. The Quincy Avenue ramp improvement was fascinating. The board did approve that. And that was a um, collaborative effort between Arapahoe County, a, um, a, a transportation district of Southern Aurora and the E-470 Authority. And, and, um, and then from there, we did adopt the strategic plan. Uh, heard from the executive director. And at about that time, Mayor Williams, the chairman, did go ahead and call for other business and adjourn us. Thank you, uh, Director Teal. Last track, do we have any more, Mr. Van Meter? Pass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A little bit sooner. Informational items, please take note of items 20 through 23, and also a few key items to remember. Um, the board work session for June 5th in the Performance and Engagement Committee may be canceled, and we will uh, send out an email in about a week, so watch out for that. Also a reminder that the June board meeting is canceled, which is on June 19th, uh, as that includes the financial and budget. Then we're also gonna move the work session for July from July 3rd, probably gonna move it to July 10th, just to move it away from the holiday. <laughs> so did you put that all on your phones? Oh. <laughs> I'm sure Connie will make sure we all know and we're on track. Other. Other than that, we, our next board meeting will meet July 17th. Any other matters by members? Yes, Director Shaw. Thank you. For those of you attending tomorrow night's uh, pre-party uh, Southeast Rail Extension, uh, check your instructions, but I believe you exit uh, or deboard at the Lincoln Station and take a shuttle to the uh, CU South Denver uh, uh, location for the celebration. If you're coming on Saturday between 10 and 2, you can deboard at either Lincoln Station or, or I'm sorry, um, uh, you can actually deboard at Sky Ridge Station where the festivities will be held. But there's really no parking around Sky Ridge Station. So if you are driving, you'll want to drive to either Lincoln Station or the end of line. Ridgegate Parkway and take the train to Sky Ridge. We hope to see you. Thank you, Director Shaw. Any other matters? Seeing none, I just want to note that I'm 51 minutes ahead of schedule for Mr. Roth. Loosen your grip.